Hello, I'm Dr. Luther, Chief Dental Officer at Western Dental. I'm excited to introduce our new implant program in partnership with the team at Implant Direct. Implant Direct is going to be a great partner for Western Dental. Not only are they going to pro provide the clinical support and training that our clinicians need to restore implants, they're also going to supply hands-on training for our general dentists to restore those implants and refer those implants to the placement doctors. In the coming months, we're going to roll out implant classes in all locations to train our general dentists in hands-on sessions. So they're going to be comfortable not only referring, but restoring those implants. The initial focus is going to be the placement and restoration of single tooth implants. Doctors are going to feel comfortable in all phases of treatment. Following that, we're going to concentrate on overdentures. Many of our denture patients are going to be excited to have the added retention that implants will allow, as well as those patients that are going to be receiving dentures in the future. Implant dentistry is really the wave of the future. When we think that at Western Dental we, ref we extract 450,000 teeth per year, there's a tremendous opportunity for our clinicians to increase their practice and also afford their patients with cutting edge treatment. The satellite offices are going to not only receive all the training they need to place and restore implants, but Implant Direct is going to be continually available to them to give them the added technical and clinical support they need going forward. Success means that all of our clinicians are going to be comfortable with an implant initiative. What that means is that instead of referring patients for bridges or routine dentures, they're going to be referring their patients for implants to restore those single tooth extractions and then also more patients for overdentures. The reason I'm so excited about this clinical program is that we're going to support our entire clinical team. We're going to give training to the placement doctors, the implantologists, the periodontists, and other dentists who place the implants. But even more importantly, we're going to make the general dentists comfortable with restoring these implants. This is so important for the entire team because it's going to allow you to really grow your practice and offer your patients procedures that are on the cutting edge. No longer will they have to have dentures that are not supported by implants, but they're going to feel comfortable moving forward, being able to eat and talk in a way that they've never been able to do before. The referring doctor is going to benefit in many ways. Once the implants are placed, he's going to receive those patients back and do the restorations. Implant restoration is not only interesting, but it's also very, very profitable and a good growth opportunity that will allow you to grow your business. I'm so excited about our implant initiative and our partnership with Implant Direct because for the first time, we're really going to put it all together. We're going to provide training not only for those dentists that place implants, we're going to manage inventories, and we're going to give general dentists an opportunity to expand their practices by not only doing crown and bridge, but for the first time really feeling comfortable placing implants, not only for single tooth sites, but also for implant supported dentures. The training for all of this is going to be hands on. So you'll see in the next few months that training is going to be offered in multiple locations. You'll be able to go learn how to refer patients, diagnose patients, and most importantly, feel comfortable restoring implants. This will allow you to treat your patients more effectively and also grow your business. Implant Direct is not only going to help provide the training, but they're going to be there in the future for all of your technical and clinical support you're going to be able to look to them for guidance if you have issues or have questions. I think together this is going to just mushroom into an opportunity that we've never seen before. I'm Dr. Nathan Doyle. I'm a uh, 1997 Oregon Health Science and University graduate, 
uh, CIRAC mentor and an AAID uh, fellow, uh, associate fellow. And uh, I teach an implant camp, uh, class called Dental Implant Camp. We'll be discussing today restorative options and standard of care, choosing an implant system, comparing active uh, to interactive implants, go direct implants, bone grafting, one versus two stage surgery, temporization of implants, healing abutments and impressions, restorative options, planning, complications, and implant maintenance. The first part we're going to be talking about, of course, is com comparing modern restorative options. What is the standard of care today? Um, what are you obligated to share or offer to your patients? So our options we have, what, what, what options do we have with uh, restorative options with missing teeth? We've got a bridge. Yeah, we've got dentures. We've got full dentures. Of course, we've got implants. Yeah, so it's implant bridge. And we have a, a retained denture. And then we have an all-on implant fixed uh, bridge. So let's look at some of our options. We may have some more, but that's kind of a, the idea that we have for uh, implants. Now, comparing those two, if we compare just the single implant to a th three unit bridge, it's kind of our bread and butter day-to-day -day thing we have. I want to look at the advantages of an implant versus the advantages of a bridge. And we're looking at both of them are aesthetic, both have function, both are predictable, both are reliable. Now, look at, let's look at the advantages of an implant. It does not affect adjacent teeth. It does not decay. It's less likely to develop gum disease and supports and maintains the bones. The bones maintained while it's, the implant's in place. Disadvantages. First thing, everyone says it costs more. Second thing, it's more planning time. It takes more time to put this together. It requires minor surgery. Uh, re requires healing time before a permanent tooth can be placed. So it's a time eff effort also that goes into it. So let's look at the uh, advantages of a bridge. It's less costly, about $1,000 less in many cases. Requires less time for a final, final result. You know, you can prep a crown the same, a bridge that same day and, and have a temporary at least in place. Disadvantages. Requires enamel removal of the adjacent teeth or even removal of the previous crowns of adjacent teeth. It's more likely to develop gum disease. Tooth decay is a potential problem. Allows the bone to atrophy underneath that pontic, nothing supporting the bone there. The last thing is a root canal treatment may be required if nerves are affected. So the idea was, is that it's no longer, it's uh, cost less. The fact is it may actually cost the same or more if you're looking at if it affects an adjacent tooth. So we're gonna look now, just to remove the money and the time involved in uh, the implants. Let's look at what it does for the teeth. Most of them rely, lie in the, uh, the advantages lie in the implants and, and more of the disadvantages lie with the bridge. So let's look at our obligation to our patients. Um, the form consent, we have the PARQ. I know in Oregon, we are required to, to share with the patient, make sure we understand or explain to the patient their options. And if we're proposing something, we also need to make sure there are any available alternative procedures are, are discussed. So if we've discussed with the patient only a bridge and haven't discussed the option of an implant, we really aren't following the law that we're supposed to be following here and giving them all the options. So here's the, here's the, the facts about an implant. Dental implants are about 95% successful for 15 years. Well, let's compare that to a, to a bridge. Bridges are 33% successful after 15 years. So one in three bridges will fail by year 15. Um, not a, not a good success rate in my, in my eyes. Success rates become or decrease even further if any of the adjacent abutments are root canal. So you can have a lower success rate. Removal, par removal partials also will have a lower uh, success rate lasting only three to five years. You know, things change, bite changes. Dental implants are or are becoming the standard of care to replace missing teeth. So that's kind of our obligation now to tell patients, hey, this is your option. These are your options. So we need to at least uh, bring that into the, um, the discussion with the patient. So how do we get case acceptance? How does a, a patient accept this more expensive uh, option? Well, what I look at is, what would I want if this was me or my family member? If this was my, my brother, my wife, and this is what I was presented with, failing, uh, uh, fractured crown, a tooth, 
what would I want for her? And, and do you feel com uh, competent providing restorative implant procedures? So unfortunately, for many patients, a lot of the doctors don't feel comfortable re uh, restoring or placing implants, and so they don't give that option sometimes. And so when we talk about the PARQ, oftentimes they're avoiding the discussion of, hey, an implant's an option. I think more and more now, today, we're getting more doctors that are sharing that information, even though they aren't comfortable or very comfortable with restoring them. So what we want you to do is we want you to become comfortable with that. Get to the point where you're actually feeling comfortable with placing or at least restoring the implants. So when is it appropriate to do an implant rather than a three unit bridge? Well, we're gonna talk about that. And also, when is it not? So here's a strong indications for when implants are indicated. So adjacent teeth are virgin. There's non-restored crowns would not be an appropriate restorative choice on their own. So if you wouldn't put crowns in the adjacent teeth on their own without being a bridge, that's probably not a great choice. You probably should be leaning towards an implant. Uh, no abutment teeth to a dentulous area, so there's no teeth behind it to, a, to a bridge to. Cantilevers aren't shown to be a great, a great idea going very far back. But here we have an uh, example of an implant um, restoring that dentulous space in the back. Um, increased decay rate. We've seen those cases where you see decay underneath the bridge or they have a high decay rate. Not a great plan for somebody, especially as people get older, they uh, tend to have some more medications, get dried out more, and their decay rate, especially if they're on the gum line, increases. And so when we have somebody who's older um, having a decay rate that uh, is increased, they're not a good, good candidate for an implant, or for a, they're not a very good candidate for a, uh, a bridge. Um, also, uh, denture failure, they're g gagging. They, they really can't stand having an imp uh, a, a denture in their mouth or discomfort with their dentures. Really not do doing very well with, with the discomfort of denture or dislodges too much. Um, or they, they have a desire for a fixed appliance. So that's where our implants really uh, become a, a good uh, option for us. So our next thing is, is when are implants not indicated? Well, not enough bone or, not our current, uh, or no current way of grafting the volume necessary. A good example is uh, one of our patients who was in a car accident and lost everything, all her maxillary up to her uh, nasal spine. Well, grafting there was not a really good plan and uh, she now has a, a large uh, partial denture and, and it's working very fine for her. Multiple failed implants or grafts in the same location and uh, being considered for another implant. You know, after the fifth or sixth time, you probably might plan for something else. So maybe an indication. Uh, not enough space for an implant. For example, we need, we need some space, three millimeters at least, plus the size of the implant. If the smallest implant you have is a three millimeter, 3.2 millimeter, you need 6.2 millimeters at least for an implant. If you only got 4.5, especially in the lower anteriors, not a great plan for, a, uh, for an implant. So like in this case, we did a cantilevered uh, uh, fixed uh, bridge for her and uh, it's working out great for her. Um, multiple pre precautions for implants. Um, uncontrolled diabetes, uh, bisphosphonates with a CRX serum level of, of uh, lower than 150, uh, smoking within the past two years, um, osteoporosis, bruxism, uncontrolled periodontal disease, thin biotype, non-compliant non patient. Now maybe by themselves, one of those may not be uh, a contraindication, but combined together, you might think twice about placing an implant. Um, some of our implant restorative options again, we can do a locator all on four, um, retention of a removable denture, those are options. We can do uh, two implants in a lower anterior for a, a lower denture and it retains that denture nicely. Um, even a, a splinted over denture bar. Um, again, we can even do ball, ball retained over dentures. I'm more of a fan of the locators if I'm gonna retain a denture. Um, and I'll show you some more options as we go along for, for that. Um, but they work out great for, for a lot of patients that really want some retention for that, for that denture. Um, converting a traditional denture to an implant retained denture is a pretty neat thing for a lot of patients. It's a, a great life change for some people who really have had a struggle, with, especially with lower dentures. And now you can convert them. One of the processes is using like a go direct uh, implant, um, placing it on four or just two in the lower, uh, lower anterior and then uh, converting them. Um, when you're doing this, you want to make sure as you, as you convert this, you remember the little white um, blockout ring as you're converting it. And I'll show you kind of the technique. It's pretty, pretty simple, pretty easy. Once you have the denture in place, um, you can mark where the, de where the implants are, the heads of the implants, drill out the, uh, the, 
the space where the uh, locators are, are at, and it gives you, make sure it's passive so that it fits all the way down. Once you have that space, you can put the black uh, inserts in the little uh, metal tops, put them on the place, make sure you put the, again, the white ring down, don't forget that. And then you fill that area, you put the denture in place and fill that area with some uh, acrylic and it picks up the, uh, the, the housing and now you just swap out the black uh, processing for the blue or for one of the other retentive. It's pretty easy to do and it's a life changer for the patients. Um, you can also find some more information about that um, on, online. Um, uh, implant restorative options, a fixed implant bridge and an all-on uh, implant bridge or a hybrid. Um, these are great options for patients and, and I think this is a, a, one of the things I love doing uh, for patients as well. Um, giving them a, a fixed uh, or all-on four or all-on six, all-on five, whatever the number may be, doesn't really matter as long as it's, it's, uh, you're doing uh, the, right, the right number for the patient. Um, it's not a great option if the lip line is excessively high. So you don't want to see that line. You make sure that, that if you don't have that space, you might have to do a flange. And you might decide to do a removable um, a hybrid or something else that you can remove rather than having a fixed bridge that has a line or a space underneath it. Um, some patients have a problem with, with speech, so you have to watch out for that as well. Um, again, we're back to uh, a single restorative tooth restoration. A uh, single tooth solution for a single tooth problem. I think that's a great option versus drilling down two adjacent teeth in order to fix a one tooth problem. How do you choose an implant system? This is where we want to go next. So out of all these choices out there, I'm going to bombard you with a whole bunch of options here. This is kind of what I went through when I was looking at all the implant systems. And, I, and trust me, I've, I've gone through many of them. I have them. I have a, have a bunch of them sitting in my, uh, in my office. <laughs> and the kits that are, go with them. You have Nobel, you got Strawman, Denseply, BioHorizon, Biomet, uh, 3i, Hyosin, you have Zimmer, you have Implant Direct. You have all these imp different implants. And uh, how do you go about choosing? You know, which one did you choose? And so I had to go through and kind of figure out a little algorithm for myself to kind of figure out how do, which, which do I want? Which is the one that I think works best for me? So first thing I looked at is, well, which is the surface? Which surface is the best, the most important surface? Some people talk about, oh, this, our surface is, is, the most, is the best surface to, to have bone grow to it. So we looked at them all. You know, you have this you have soluble blast media. You have RMB, R, RBM, you have osteotite, acid washed, sandblasted and acid washed. You have sandblasted with large grip acid washed. You have hydroxyapatite, you have micro textured titanium, you have laser lock, laser textured. Which one's the best? And here's the findings they found. They all worked. They all worked fine. So they all worked, they all integrated, and in, in, in vivo studies, they all worked. And so any of these systems that are out there that, that we're talking about being the best, it's hard to, to put that quantifiably as, as the, the, the truth. The fact is they all work. And so you're, you're gonna have to choose which one's gonna fit you. Next thing I went to, okay? So if, if texture of the surface isn't, they're all working right there, which of the restorative parts do I want? Which is the platform I want when I'm done? Or the doctors that I, that re, that I place an implant for, what do they wanna restore when we're finished? So you have all these options again too, all these different types. And then you have all the body types, the, t the implant, Body, how does it interact with the bone as you're placing the implant? How does it have initial stabilization? What works, what's the best thing to work out there? So going through all these things, what I decided to do, I decided to take all that away and just go through what I want. Um, do I want tapered versus straight? Do I want a bone level or a tissue level? Do I want deep threads that, that you can change the, the direction as you're placing the implant after you drew? cut your osteotomy, do you want to be able to go in there and change it as you go, or do you want to follow the osteo osteotomy you prepared? How about mini threads? Did that help at all for reduced stress at the crest, crest of, the, of the bone? Um, implant uh, platform, do I want an external hex or an internal hex, or internal connection? Uh, flat platform or some kind of bevel as the, pl as the implant uh, platform goes into the, uh, into the implant, you want that to be beveled or do you want it to be flat? Um, Non-platform switched versus platform switched. Is there an advantage of having platform switched? Um, and so here's, my, here's what I came out with. I, I chose tapered. I, I, I'd rather have tapered than I wanted uh, than straight. I have bone level for the options I had. If I wanted to look at different things, I might use a tissue level once in a while, but 
is that enough for me to get a whole kit or a whole bunch of implants to justify those few times I've used it? So I, I chose bone level. Deep threads to, to change direction or just deep enough threads? Well, one of them I'm, I'm flashing here so we can see that one of them would, but I want to keep it on there because I want to talk about this, this implant later too. So I kept it on there. Um, multi, how about mini threads at the top of the uh, nearest to the, uh, the cortical bone to reduce the stress at that? Or do you want to have that stress transferred to it? You don't. So mini threads is, is helpful at the top. So let me get a couple other implants. Um, how about uh, external versus internal connection? Well, we've, we know now that pretty much internal connection is what I chose. I want to have that, that, those forces centered further down in the implant, in the center of the implant. Uh, flat platform or beveled? I want to have a beveled. I want to have that implant be able to slide in and have a, have a, a uh, emergence profile that comes out rather than being flat and then coming out, bringing that, that margin towards the bone. I want it away from the bone, which leads me to the next one, which is platform switched. I like having a platform switch, bringing that margin of where that implant and that, that abutment integ uh, integrate together. I want that away from the bone a little bit. And so here's my, my final implants. There's about seven of them. Okay. And, and here they are. Now where do I go? Okay. Let's look at these. There's one more thing that we, we wanted to talk about that I wanted to mention, make sure you're aware of. There's a commercially pure titanium and there's titanium alloy. Now, commercially pure titanium is going to have a tensile strength of about 240 to 550 megapascals, while a titanium alloy is going to have 860 to 930, much higher. What does that mean? That means that when you have a, a smaller implant, those forces on those smaller implants can actually fracture or break those implants that have a lower tensile strength. That's a problem when you're trying to place an implant, you have high torque, you're placing an implant uh, about you know, 50 or maybe even 70, in a location, it's the highest you want to go, but all of a sudden you have a crack in the implant or some problem because you have a softer titanium alloy. I wanted something stronger to, to resist those. So here's how they look. The tensile strength becomes more of a factor again when you have a, a smaller implant. And here are our two, our two, our two camps. We have uh, the Nobel Strawman and Dense Ply on the one side, BioHorizon Zimmer and Implant Direct on the right side. So this brought me into, these are my guys. These are, after all my, my looking and finding, these are the guys uh, I kind of looked at. Um, and so today when I, look, when I look at my decisions of what I wanted to use, uh, three of them uh, fit into a uh, 45 degree angle uh, bevel and one fits into a 78 degree bevel, deeper bevel. I'll, I'll talk more about what that means. And so I have these, these, uh, these three, the BioHorizon Zimmer and, and Legacy from Implant Direct, and then I have the interactive. And interactive is, uh, I'll show you what that means. So the lead bevel, when you come to it, what happens is this is where the level of the implant uh, begins to bevel down and you have this lowering of the center of the implant down further. So it gives you uh, more of a connection to the inside of the implant as, it's, as you're screwing that, that implant in place or the, the uh, restorative portion, when you're screwing the restorative portion in place, gives you more of a connection in there, and it leads out with a, a better um, emergence profile, a little more straight, or, more, uh, straight up out of, the, out of the implant. Brings the center of, of the implants uh, screwed down further. That uh, changes the forces, the physics of it. So I, I like that. Implant, uh, the Nobel did a great job with their active in that restorative portion, portion of it. I really like that. So this is where uh, we're comparing our, our legacy. So I played place Legacy for a long time. Uh, I like it. I still play, especially the larger ones I still place because those are my options I have out there. Um, but the Legacy, the thing I found was it has uh, four platforms. That means I have to carry four different types of restorative uh, prop, uh, materials. I have to have different sizes. Um, that's, it, it works for a lot of people to have the, that many options. But it only has three platform switches. Only three of them have platform, true platform switch. A 0.2 isn't really a true platform switch, but a 0.7 and a 1.3 are, are considered to be a, a significant uh, platform switch. So you have four platforms and, only, and three platform switching. Comparing that now to the interactive, interactive we have uh, two platforms. So you have less inventory to keep 
to try to restore these guys, these guys. So I like that. It means there's less things I have to worry about. Is this uh, four things to choose from? I just have two. Uh, it makes it sim more simple for me and for any restorative dentists that are, are restoring these. It also has three platform switches. So even though it only has two platforms, the only reason they, they can't do a platform switch is because the smallest one is too small. You can't go any smaller than that. So the other ones are all platform switched. That means that the, the interac interface of the abutment is, and the implant is further away from the bone, maintaining the bone uh, health. So you see longer success, success rates. Plus, the, the, center of grab, the center of the forces are brought down further because of the, the interaction of how far down that, that uh, platform is. And so you have all these forces are, are doing better at the uh, bone level. So I, that for me, that, that it won by far. So now I've got um, an implant that I can, I can have the forces being stronger than the Nobel, uh, but have the platform of the Nobel. So for me, this became all the best of all worlds coming together in this implant. So I'm pretty excited about that. One of the things they did is they, they had it before with this interactive with the abutment already on it. And I, I, I voiced my opinion to them many times. I hated that. I hated that. I hated having that be forced to have that, that abutment on there uh, to, 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 as, as a mount to put my implant in. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it guided. I couldn't, do, I couldn't use it that way. So it, it frustrated me quite a bit. Then they came out with a simply interactive where they got rid of the abutment, and I'm a happy guy. I can now, I can now use this, uh, this in ways that I couldn't use it before because the abutment got in my way. So let's compare now the Noble Active to the Implant Directs Interactive. Just do a, uh, we'll do a straight comparison. This is what they look like. The bodies are completely different. The Interactive has the same body as the Legacy, Legacy 2. The only difference is the very top part, and we'll talk more about that. But the interesting part, I've heard a lot of people say, but, but they're different. Uh, they may not be exactly the same as far as the, the, um, the dimensions. But what we found is the dimensions are the same. The dimensions of that abutment uh, the platform is the same, exactly the same from the two of them. The interesting part that I think is interesting to me too is they're both owned by Danaher. So Danaher owns both of these companies. And so for me, that, that gives me a little bit, bit of, hey, is Danaher going to allow a problem to be with these two platforms? And I, I don't think so. They wouldn't allow that. But we've done our own studies and, and looking at it and it came out that they, uh, they're the same dimensions and same tolerances. So. It excites me to be able to use those. Again, the differences I look at are the commercial per titanium with the, with the bio, uh, Nobel BioCare and a uh, titanium alloy. So I have a stronger, I have a better strength with my interactive, but the same platform. So I'll give you an example. Now, a lot of doctors are asking, well, is it really, um, are they really interchangeable? And so we did a full on, all on uh, six case and we used all uh, interactive implants uh, with, with Nobel BioHorizon components. And even the drills we used, and this, is the, this is the surgery. Again, in here we're using all the guides, everything has been designed for the Nobel Active. The drills are Nobel drills. The keys are Nobel keys. Um, the only thing we did is we used uh, the implant direct interactive, same lengths, same sizes. Uh, this is even a mount um, from Nobel uh, to, to fully guide the implant. So for me, I'm looking, I, I, for me to show this is, is one of those uh, testimonies that, hey, this works. This is, uh, I now have a really strong uh, implant, the implant that I like to use, being able to be used in, in an all-on case, fully guided using all Nobel stuff. Again, this is sped up, so, so I don't play implants at that speed, just so you know. I sped it up for your, for your see if we get too bored watching this. And then again, we're, we're putting our, our torques on this. And uh, again, this is through the guide. So it's going to have higher torques because of the, the interaction of the, but 70 Newtons is where we're hitting here. It's pretty darn strong uh, torques on this. And, and from this point on, we start placing our multi-unit abutments. All, again, all Nobel multi-unit abutments. Uh, again, the conical connection is exactly the same from the implant direct and the, uh, the Nobel. So the interactive has the same canal connection as the, as the, uh, as the active. This is as far as I can take it so you guys can see that 
all the parts all worked. There's his before and there's his, his after. Again, one week post-op, all, all on six using interactive implants from Implant Direct with Nobel bio, BioCare components. So it, it works. Okay, we're we'll looking at how uh, we have like a legacy interactive and go direct. That's another one that uh, many doctors will place is they'll go direct in order to uh, do a simplified uh, all uh, transition to uh, re re retentive uh, denture. So they'll add the, uh, on top of this, they'll have the, uh, the locators already uh, embedded on the implant. So, uh, so when do you use those? When do you use the go direct rather than you know, something else? Well, it may be for a simple transition, for a, a simple transition for a, for a uh, denture. And uh, what you can do, if you, didn't, if you place the implant, decide later you want to do something else, there's a screw, there's a set screw that's inside the top of it. It doesn't do anything other than it's there to keep things from, from getting in there. You can actually remove that. And once it's removed, you can add uh, multi-unit abutments on there. So then you convert it to an to a all-on um, fixed bridge. You can do it a ball attachments on there if you want to instead. Those work. Or if, it's, if it was too low, you can actually add an extender because the tissue was too, it was too low for the tissue. You now can have an extender on top of it. So it, it works for you. They, they thought about, about this um, all the way through. So it's a good option to do, uh, to do uh, go direct. So simple thing for, for a doctor to place. A bone grafting at time of uh, some of surgery. So one of the things we, we, must, we need to talk about is bone volume. You know, one of the problems we might have, a contraindication would be there's not enough bone volume um, for you to place an implant. Well, um, you've got to have stable bone around an implant. And these are the kind of the numbers you talk about. And, and in my class that I teach, we talk about these things and we actually go through, through uh, some hands-on uh, practices to make sure we know these numbers. We have to have a millimeter and a half between our, our healthy tooth and our implant. Between the implants, we, have, we have to have three millimeters. There there's, needs to be uh, this, this three millimeters for the, the bone to be healthy and survive between the implants. If you violate that, what you'll see is that bone will begin to die back and you'll see bone loss there. Same thing with going too close to adjacent tooth. But these numbers, if you follow these numbers, you, you'll be fine. The buckle, uh, 1.8, and lingual, one, one millimeters. Typically in the linguals, you'll see uh, the, 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 the bone will be more stable long term. And so you can get away with a 1 versus 1.8 on the, on the lingual or palatal. So those are your numbers you got to follow by. Uh, what if there's not enough bone? Now what, do you, now what do you do? Okay, so a lot of things you can do. Um, uh, use more narrower implant. You can use a narrower implant in those areas. Uh, rather than using a, a 4.3, you can drop down to a, a 3.7 or a 3.2, making sure that you're remembering that you don't want to place a, a 3.2 at number 18, back in the lower molar. Not a great plan. So you got to do it within reason. Um, bone may be expanded. You can expand bone. So this is for when you're referring to another doctor. Remember, they can it, for, a, for to a surgeon, we can expand the bone. We can expand it, make it, make it wider, then place the implant. So you're not limited by by just the, the current thickness you have of the bone, you can actually expand that. Um, you can do bone grafting, of course. You can block graft on top of an area. Um, you can do a sinus lift. You know, so if, oftentimes I've heard doctors say to me, um, I, or a patient would come in saying, I, my doctor told me I couldn't have an implant because I didn't have bone in my sinuses. My sinuses were too big, and uh, so I can't have an implant. And I'm going, no, you, you can have an implant, but I'd have to do a little surgery beforehand to get that bone there. They're like, really? They didn't tell me that. So I want to let you guys know, you can do that. You can add bone to the sinuses, uh, and to the sinus membrane, and raise it up, let it heal, and place the implants in those areas that before didn't have, didn't have the right kind of bone. So this all can be done. The best time to, um, to maintain the bone is at the time of extraction. So that's what we want to do, is preserve it in the first place. That's the best time to do it. So I'm going to do a, a quick little overview with you of how to do a, a, a bone grafting at the time of extraction. So the best thing to do, again, is to maintain the bone volume when you're, when you're at the time of extracting the tooth. So when you're extracting a, a tooth, the idea that you might have this patient might want to do an implant later, the best time to do the bone, gra bone grafting is at that time. Take the tooth out, clean it all up, and place the bone. Um, bone grafting, again, aids the bone volume and preserves um, pres preservation after the extraction. 
it's best to preserve it is right then. So here's the technique we want to talk about. Um, remove all the fragments, remove everything out of there, get everything out of there beforehand. Infection and soft tissue, that honestly takes me the most time of a bone grafting after, after extraction. The most time I spend is getting all the granulation tissue and infection out of there. That's, it's pretty meticulous. You can't leave something out there. And I'll show you an example of why that's important. Um, position the, the non-resorbable membrane at least three millimeters under the lingual or pal and palatal of the periosteum before placing the graft material. So again, you place it towards the palatal or place towards the lingual. That way you can have access to where you're gonna place the bone graft. And I'll show an example of that here too. The stability of the graft and blood supply from the periosteum increases the chance of the graft being successful. Um, so uh, this is most affected by the suturing techniques. Suturing, how you suture this, this together is gonna affect that. So I'll show you the, te the technique uh, for how to do that, how to do the, the suturing. This is what it looks like. We call, I call it a horizontal crossing mattress suture. It's a mattress suture that actually twists part way through. So I'll show you how, you how you do that and it's pretty simple. This is what, this is actually from, uh, for courtesy of uh, Hilt Tatum, I appreciate him allowing us to use these. Again, it goes from the, if you're placing the, the suturing, you go from the mesial to the distal of the, uh, of the incision, then you go from the mesial to the distal again, and then you tie. And that makes a, a mattress suture that crosses. And then one more thing we do is we add interrupted sutures on both papillas, both sides of the extraction. That reinforces that area. That right there will, will give you a, a very successful uh, bone grafting. So this is an example of it. Just uh, removing a, we spent a lot, a lot of time we spent removing. We actually used, in this case, we used a, uh, a round burr, a uh, surgical round burr to go in and, and degranulate some of the things. Right now we're just scooping out the, the largest portions of the, of the granulation tissue. Yeah, I do. We use a, a slow speed round burr just to clean out all the rest of the gunk in there. You could use uh, some other types of uh, burrs in there as well, or just spend more time uh, curetting, and again, get that thing clean. We want it really clean. Um, don't leave anything behind in there. I also uh, irrigate the buccal and lingual as well underneath the, the, uh, the periosteum that we reflected. In this case, I didn't have to, uh, to, to change the size of the, uh, the membrane. Uh, sometimes I'll have to cut it so it's at least one millimeter from each tooth. So just keep that in mind when you're placing um, a membrane. You may have to cut it kind of an hourglass shape to do that. Um, this is me placing it uh, about three millimeters on the lingual. Uh, this is, again, fast speed here. I don't usually place it that fast. <laughs> but um, you get the idea of uh, replacing the, the bone. It's pretty simple um, to place. Um, and once we're done, uh, we don't, you don't really want to overpack it. There's no reason to overpack it. Um, you know, kind of just, it's just, you want to have it pretty much level you won't get anything gained out of overpacking it. Um, but the hard part is, again, sneaking that membrane underneath uh, the, uh, the periosteum. This is our technique of going from the mesial and then taking it over to the distal lingual and protecting your membrane as you're doing it. Sometimes I'll put a little um, my uh, curette underneath just to keep myself from uh, from picking up the uh, membrane. Again, going from the mesial again, over to the distal. And that, again, it, it cross, it's a crossing mattress suture. What that does is it puts the pressure right on top of the membrane, holds the membrane down so it doesn't get dislodged, and brings both sides of the tissue, periosteum, back over. And what'll happen is, <clears throat> as it heals, I typically leave it in place for about four weeks and then go back and remove the, uh, the sutures at four weeks, and I tease out the membrane at that time. You see how the, the tissue kind of just pulls up there? When you have that uh, mattress suture, just, it just sneaks everything up right there. Again, underneath there is the membrane. Some people like to have the textured um, membrane. I like actually the non-textured. Uh, the reason why is because at the time of removal, I, I think part of it was if you didn't have a good te suture technique, you needed that to kind of grab hold of the uh, the membrane, the membrane actually, when it's textured, will actually grab hold of the, uh, the tissue actually grabs hold of that membrane when it's textured like that and allows it to kind of stay on there. But what I found uh, with this suturing technique, it's sutured well enough to stay in place for those four weeks that when I go back to try to remove that, that uh, membrane, if it's textured, I have a hard time getting that out of there. And uh, the, the tissue's actually held onto there pretty tightly. 
Um, when I have it smooth, I can go in there and it's easier for me to tease that out of there without having to get them, them numb. And so most patients like that better at that time. So just do a good job with your suturing and, uh, and make sure that uh, uh, you don't skip any steps. This is what it looks like at the end. Um, tissues holding right in place and it looks great at four weeks. All right, any questions?